Guys having fun at DerbyCon? Yeah. Best con ever. It's been awesome. I'm not doing the hard thing. <laughs> Good night, Cleveland. We're in Louisville. This is not Somebody Cleveland. Else. Oh, that's a good point. <laughs> so they <laughs> well, well, <laughs> wow, you're sitting next to Jason Street. <laughs> Shit, we're going downhill this already. Is all, yeah. So welcome to the talk. <laughs> yeah, they put us on last because they thought most yeah. of the people would have left already. They didn't want to subject you to Tom and I. <laughs> you fooled them. <laughs> Thanks for showing up. Today is a desktop betrayal. We're going to start talking about, well, a whole bunch of stuff, basically attacking users through the feature sets they demand out of their client applications. So flip to the next slide. I'm Kevin Johnson, owner of Secure Ideas. We're a small consulting firm out of Jacksonville. Nerd. Yeah, Kevin who? Yeah, that's what everybody says that. Yeah, not and, and I'm not Kevin <laughs> Mitnick. <laughs> Can you tell the difference? <laughs> yeah, stun double, yeah. When you, yeah, I'm, with, I'm there when you don't need slimy. So, uh, I, st <laughs> we're not going to make it very far, are we? Yeah, author of 542, 642, 571, various SANS classes regarding web security and mobile security, and I'm an open source bigot. Uh, founder of the uh, Samurai Project, Laudanum Ocoso, Weaponized Flash, more projects than I can keep track of. You know you have an addiction where somebody says, how many projects are you running and you have to go look? <laughs> I'm Tom Aston. Um, I'm currently the manager of the Secure State Profiling Team up in uh, Cleveland, Ohio. So I'm a, a Yankee, unlike this southerner here from Florida. Florida's not southern. <laughs> well, that's another country altogether. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, we don't want to talk about that. <laughs> well, there you go. Yeah, or that's Cleveland. Right. That's, or Cleveland. <laughs> uh, I'm a security blogger, uh, founder of a, a website called socialmediasecurity.com. Uh, I've written a Facebook privacy and security guide, which I have to continuously update because Facebook keeps making stupid changes. Um, so I will keep updating, updating that as we go. Um, I co-host two podcasts, Security Justice, when we uh, try to record. Um, right, Dave? every couple months now, and then the uh, Social Media Security Podcast. And I also speak at Black Hat, DEF CON, ScrewCon, OWASP, et cetera. DerbyCon. And DerbyCon. Yeah. Now you can say that. So desktop betrayal. The idea here is, is that for years, security-wise, we focused on exploits. Exploits are cool, right? I always joke around with people. Nobody ever sits there and says, dude, the reconnaissance I did was amazing, right? <laughs> <laughs> Never happens. You guys go to that DEF CON talk? No, of course not, right? It's pop that box, got that zero day, because it's not an O day, it's a zero day. The problem is, <laughs> the problem is people patch it. People fix those issues. They deploy antivirus, they deploy web app firewalls, whatever. So what about the feature set the client applications have given us because the crack smokers at W3C have helped us out by increasing the complexity of our browsers. Thank you very much. Anybody here from the W3C? We have examples of crack smoking in our presentation, actually. Yeah, yeah. I'm serious. You'll see in a second. Yeah. So, what about using those feature sets to abuse the client? And that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to throw out some ideas, throw out some. Uh, techniques that you can, during your cross-site scripting attack or just random web pages you build and trick people to go to porn, and uh, what things can you do against those browsers? Rick Roll's Rick old. That's old. We, we're retiring that. <laughs> Same thing with the lava roll from ShmooCon. Uh, but let's take a look back at kind of how this all started when Kevin and I got some ideas for this talk. Um, you may remember us, uh, uh, myself, Robin Wood here in the audience. Woohoo! 
Uh, Robin pr presented with us at Shmukan a couple years ago. Um, we kind of made this uh, this series of of, um, of talks, the social zombies talks, where we really wanted to focus on exploiting clients through social networks. Um, and what we found, similar to this talk, is really there wasn't any kind of zero day or any kind of exploits we were releasing for like Facebook, but we're just taking advantage of the features that are in the social networks and using them in our penetration tests. We love Facebook. And we do. So in this talk, there will be no talks of social networking at all because we have thoroughly beat that horse. The, yeah. the horse is dead, guys. There's when, no more social networking talks from Kevin and I. When Tom and I were talking about what we're gonna talk about here, we both, like, very first thing, both of us say, no fucking social networks. Nope. We're not doing it anymore. Nope. We all know about the issues with social networks. We, you know, it's all over the place. So what did we learn, guys, when it came to social networks? Well, first of all, never accept friend requests from that man. You guys still do that. Why do you do that? Thank you, by the way. Thank you. And of course, never click on Kevin's links. You guys know better, okay? How many people here know not to click on links from me? Liars. Yeah, I don't know. Some of you do it anyway. We appreciate that, thanks. How many of are you? I'm sorry? How many of are you? I currently have right around 5,000 Facebook accounts. Allegedly. <laughs> Everything that yeah, Kevin sends you is just JavaScript, so don't worry about it. So why attack the client, right? You know, client-side attacks, this is nothing new. We've been doing this stuff for years. Um, you know, phishing, social engineering, these attacks are always going to work. It's the weakest link in a company is the end user. They're stupid. But something that I've noticed is being a consultant for the last year and a half, I came from a big company over to consulting, and I've noticed that when we sell pen tests, uh, it's very difficult to either sell the client-side attacks or convince the customer that they want us to do client-side attacks. So this is something I, I heard in uh, Carlos Perez's presentation yesterday uh, where he mentioned about sales and getting involved with sales to uh, ensure that the scoping is correct for these things. Um, but we find a lot of challenges uh, often, oftentimes pulling off client size attacks, like especially when we find cross-site scripting, like in an external pen test, I want to use that and demonstrate to the client the real risks and using techniques that we're going to talk about today might be some things you might want to include. And even if you're sales guys, or if you're smaller and don't have sales guys, when you start dealing with the client, a lot of times the client will say to you, well, yeah, so what? We know the users are gonna click that stuff. We know they're gonna fall for it, so why bother? And one of the things that we try to do, uh, both of us at our, our respective firms, is we try to explain to them it's not a test to say, did your idiot, oh, I'm sorry, users, click the link, what could we do when? they click the link. And it is a when, as everybody in the room knows. So what we want to show is some techniques that aren't just these scary pop-up boxes, right? Because Hollywood is not making a movie, Attack of the Living pop-up boxes. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, whoa, 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 too far, too far. There. Okay. So <clears throat> what about the new client side, right? Uh, the world is getting, well, fuck it, better, right? Uh, every better for day. Us. We, you know, look at Firefox. What version are they on now? 37? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Who? Yeah, no, I'm not getting over Says the one Mozilla guy in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> right? Even Microsoft didn't do that with Word, right? When they went from 2 to 6. Uh, I'm just saying, just saying. Were you playing a catch up? <laughs> right? Every single time we turn around, new features are coming out, new client applications. We need to make the web work better. Better for the users and better for the attackers, right? I, the, the, the perimeter, we always heard that buzzword, right? There is no perimeter. Well, we can prove it because the users are directly connected to the internet. Yeah, you've got your web app firewalls. Yeah, you have your proxies. Yeah, you have your, your controls. We'll talk about that later. But the, the new client side, it's where it's at. Absolutely. And of course, you know, it gives us, you know, new attack possibilities never seen before. And Borat really likes that. It's very nice, very nice, very sexy, sexy exploit, sexy exploit. This is fun. So. I'm out there on the Adobe website looking for an Adobe logo because I think everybody in the room knows about my love of Adobe, the, the uh, drug users there. Um, 
and I, I'm out there looking for the logo, and I see a link for the Flash Platform <laughs> Evangelism Kit. It is now a fucking religion. <laughs> right? What the hell? Now, what my question for you is, who is going to be the first Flash martyr? <laughs> Absolutely. I, actually, it's Netflix, because they're using Silverlight. But... <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> this is their evangelism kit. The idea is, let's sell it, right? If you're that one developer who wants to use Flash and your management has a brain and won't let you, and you want to convince them, Adobe gives you this. It's a PDF. Of course, they used a PDF, right? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> and there wasn't malware in it when I downloaded it from them. And it tells you, right, this many devices can support this, this kind of crap here. And then, of course, we get to the next screen, which is where they tell us that they're committed <laughs> to securing the enterprise's data. Now, excuse me? I know, they should have been committed. Um, now, this to me is proof of something that I've been saying for years because anybody who has dealt with Adobe Player, Flash, this crap, that crap, whatever, we can tell you every single day a new zero day comes out for Flash. And we're not even talking about the feature sets they yep. give us, right? But the security of the Flash products, so the Adobe products in general are just hilarious, right? And so when I looked at this slide, I realized that this is absolutely accurate. They're, they're smoking crack, guys. Right? They're crack smokers. Now, for this graphic, I just want to do a quick shout out. I, I, he said, I was in Cleveland. Yes. I'm driving yes. to DerbyCon writing slides. <laughs> While driving. Oh, While yeah. driving. Actually, no, I had other people driving, which was great. They kept calling me Miss Daisy for some reason. And so I post to Twitter, does anybody have a picture of the Adobe logo or the W3C logo on a crack pipe or something? I'll tell you that some of the graphics I got were disgusting. <laughs> they had crack whores and all kinds oh of... Oh my goodness. One guy sent me a picture of Whitney Houston with the Adobe logo and it said Whitney Houston's comeback tour sponsor. And, uh, <laughs> that was a good one. There was a guy taking 542 from uh, Justin Searle and he saw the tweet or whatever and he decided to send me graphics, but he went one up. He tasked his marketing department to create this for me, right? That's support. So yeah, so the crack smokers at Adobe, they started reviewing, releasing stuff. And one of the things that they released, and this is a review, because we've talked about this before. I'm sure if you guys have watched talks from us before, you've seen this, is that Flash, you know that same origin policy? It's, it's inconvenient. So Adobe decided to reinvent the wheel. Yes, they invented a triangle, but the cross-domain policy controls what domains are allowed to access content from your domain, right? And it's and set into, by default, now there's other ways you can do it, but we won't go into all that kind of crap. But by default, it's in a file called crossdomain.xml, and it's typically in the web root, and what we found on the internet is the majority of people who have implemented it have implemented it with a splat, which says that the entire internet can access their content because that's what they want because they don't understand it, even though that quote is from Adobe's site. Using a cross-domain policy file could expose your site to various attacks. Please read this document before hosting a cross-domain policy. I read the document. It's confusing as hell, right? But if you set that file up incorrectly, any flash object from any domain can access your content as if it's part of the flash object, right? So. Which brings us to the idea of abusing those flash objects. If you've got a crossdomain.xml file, I don't know, let's say um, some type of smart grid control system with a crossdomain.xml file or some other controller or web app, right? We can actually build flash objects that will then allow the attacker to request things through our browser onto that website, right? So we have a, a malaria server, for example, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, and then we push that object down, and we can proxy 
through that object. Now there's two main projects that are doing this. Malaria, which we'll talk about in a second, and Weaponized Flash. Weaponized Flash is not as mature, uh, mainly because I'm the author of it. Um, <laughs> you know, it was handicapped to begin with. Um, so malaria is what we'll talk about next. Yes, so malaria is a very serious disease. Um, it's spread through uh, various means, uh, in insects, and uh, through a blood infection. Uh, actually, this guy, Bill Gates, actually has a cure for malaria. Releasing mosquitoes at a TED Talk. Yeah, seriously, he did. So you have the mosquitoes, right? Yeah, of course. Okay. <laughs> no, but really, guys, uh, malaria. So uh, this was really created as a, as a proof of concept. Um, it's been out for, what, about a little over a year now? Yeah, not, maybe, maybe two. Yep, not a, not a lot of pen testers really know about it because um, they're not really you know, sure how it works or have actually used it in a pen test. Um, so we decided to you know, explore this a little further. Uh, and basically, it creates a proxy within the browser, and it's controlled uh, by a server-side app. And then this allows you, as the attacker, to abuse a wide open cross domain.xml file. Now, I do want to point out we're, we're picking on Adobe, but this also comes yep. with Silverlight proxies, also, right? So anybody using Microsoft technologies poorly, you know, the five sites on the internet running Silverlight, um, we can abuse <laughs> them the same way, right? So here's how you use it you basically start up a server app, right? And that server app, is what you point your, the attacker's, browser at as a proxy. So you just configure it as a proxy server. And you also host that Swift file, we'll, we'll abuse Adobe because we love them, uh, somewhere and you get the, bra the victim to pick it up. Now, in this one here, this is not a subtle attack, right? The Adobe Flash object that's doing it actually says, hey, connecting to the malaria server, hey, browsing to this website for the attacker, crap like that. It is a proof of concept. It is trivial to edit the Swift file to be a, uh, I don't know, Peggle game or some other Plants vs. Zombies thing. So it's as they're playing the game, you have a proxy through their browser. Now I want to be very clear here. One, you can only get to pages that have a misconfigured cross-domain.xml file, right? Due to the complexity of the documentation and the crappily way it was written, most cross-domain.xml files are misconfigured. In, in our scanning of the internet. Um, and so as long as that's open there, I can browse through it. The other nice thing there is, once my browser, the attacker, gets through the app server over to the, to the victim browser, any requests I make using that flash proxy are made as the victim. So for internal websites, intranet websites, how many people here go somewhere and they're using Windows integrated authentication, right? I'm you now, uh, making those, those requests. It's beautiful for attacks breaching the perimeter. Because so all I have to do is let you browse to the site hosting the Flash object. It will go through proxies, it will go through controls. Oh, and this Swift file isn't seen as malware, right? There isn't an antivirus on the planet currently that will detect this as a problem. Yep, and then Kevin gets to play with your SharePoint site <laughs> I love on SharePoint. your internal network. Excellent. So uh, we took this a little step further, and what we did is we uh, took a PDF and we embedded mal malaria in it. Um, so basically, uh, what you got to do is you got to download Adobe Flex, which you know I hate installing yet another Adobe product on my system, but uh, another 200 meg download. Download that, install it, configure it, um, which basically uh, compiles uh, the Swift file, and then uh, we've got a set of Python scripts that will actually embed this into a PDF. Now start your, your proxy and then send that PDF like you would with any other type of uh, phishing attack and you're, you're golden. Now we want to be very clear, the uh, script to generate this PDF, uh, we did not create it. We found it on the internet, uh, matter of fact Tom Liston found it on the internet, sent it over to me and said, hey this is interesting, look at this. Right? Um, it has no credits as to who created it. Uh, so sadly, we can't even give props to the genius who came up with this. It works though. It works beautifully. And the best part about it is, is because people open up PDFs all the time and then just leave them there, right? How often do you go back at the end of the day and go, oh damn, I forgot to close those 87 PDFs my manager had made me open, right? Of course, it would be fun if you actually took one of W3C's actual documents and then embedded malaria in that. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, 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 CDC. CDC. That's even, even better. better. Nice. Yeah, nice. I like that. All right. So the next thing, and this is will be the rest of the talk, is where we'll be focusing on HTML5. Because HTML5 is, oh, dude. We love it's it. It's beautiful. Right? HTML5 is better than HTML4. Can anybody tell me why? It's 
It's one more, exactly. <laughs> My HTML goes to 11. <laughs> um, so HTML5, the W3C has come out with this idea, hey, let's build an application language because things are dynamic and things we want to have it work. And the first time I read that, I'm like, yeah, bitch in, <laughs> right? Because I'm thinking application server, server side, let's support the dynamicity. Yeah, I made up that word, but the dynamicity of modern apps. And then I read further in the introduction and realized, no, these crack smoking morons had decided that the app should reside in the browser. Brilliant. Right? And so we'll let it run in the browser doing kind of stuff. Now, the other thing I want to make sure you understand is that when we say HTML5, we're no longer just talking about the tag based language. JavaScript is now considered part of that overarching category. So this, this actually threw me off for a while because I'm like reading about HTML5, I'm reading the specs, I'm like, wait, that's not HTML, that's JavaScript, what the fuck? And then I realized, no, they've combined it into one. Now, when you talk HTML5, you're talking about both of these features. Now, some of the ideas we've got, right, access to your temperature controllers, because I want to know if, if your computer's getting hot. Um, <laughs> Yeah. I didn't say that you Somebody's were Somebody's watching hot. a lot of porn on their computer. Right? <laughs> Dude. Tentacle porn. We're not talking about tentacle porn today. No. Um, now, the, the What Working Group, I think, said it very clearly on their Twitter profile when they actually posted the description of the group. This isn't something they tweeted. This is their permanent, unless they change it, description when you try to follow them. Please leave your sense of logic at the door. Thanks. Really, you guys are building the next application language that we're going to use, and we don't want logic? Perfect. Notice the out. unfollow button right there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Don't unfollow them because they release some funny shit. <laughs> you. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. So, one of the questions comes out is what browsers support it, right? What, what, where can I use these attacks? What, what clients? And so, there's this great site, html5test.com not my site, some guy put it up there, it's a great site, and it actually starts telling you, when you browse to it, it'll give you your score. You, 200, you, uh, eight. But, and it tells you how many features you support and what things are there. Now, this really said a lot to me, right? Uh, Chrome, obviously, best supporter of HTML5 because uh, Google has decided that's their future. Uh, everything goes there. So Chrome, from the desktop side, from the tablet side and the mobile phone side, I was actually really surprised and very, very excited because BlackBerry is the best current supporter of HTML5, right? Now, as a pen tester, not to be rude, but I don't want your phone. I want your company's phones, right? I want access to corporate data. And the fact that BlackBerry, which is according to most people, even though I think it's a crappy phone, the primary business phone is the first to keep up with Google Chrome, that's pretty good, right? So when we start doing these attacks. So, um, of course, like Kevin just said, you know, different browsers support HTML5 differently. So, um, you know, we got to find ways to detect the capabilities of each of the browsers. So, if we're planning an attack for, you know, a client-side attack, we've got to detect certain features that we may want to abuse. So, what we did is we built a script that some of you guys may have seen this little zombie guy floating around and some links that Kevin and I may have sent out to, uh, to the Twitters and the Facebooks. Us, us send links? <clears throat> no. And of course, you guys clicked on them. Thank you very much. Appreciate um, it. So we, we built a script that basically um, uses an uh, open source JavaScript library called Modernizer. It's actually really cool. And it detects features supported by the browser. Um, it just makes it a simple thing where it does Boolean true false values, sets it to a one or a zero, and then you just write code, and then you record that data. So specific things that we are interested in is does, you know, do your, does your web browser support you know, WebSockets, SQL database, uh, local storage, geolocation, you know, things that we can abuse as an attacker. And uh, also, Spencer at Secure State wrote some really cool uh, code. Uh, he wrote a Python HTTP server to actually collect this data for us, which is pretty neat. 
So uh, here's kind of what the page looked like. You may have seen that clicking on that. You all um, saw it, right? Yeah, yeah. That's Kevin dancing as a zombie, and then we had hamster dance music and playing in the in the background, which is very appropriate. Uh, so the code, very simple. You know, we just did some simple checks, just modernizer.websockets, and then if that result is zero or is it a one, and then we would save it to a file. And then what we did is we collected uh, your user agent, your IP, um, and then what capabilities the browser supported, and then your we Facebook collected profile. <laughs> yep. oh, wait, no, we didn't do that. One. No, no, we didn't do that. No. I lied. Yeah. <laughs> So, so our results from uh, everybody that clicked on these, um, basically we found that local storage and geolocation um, are the two features that most of the browsers support. Um, so that was kind of neat. And then the web browser results, uh, ironically all you guys like to click on our stuff uh, on desktops. So uh, you know, compared with the mobile browsers, only 27%. So. This one actually surprised us, and maybe it's because of the way we use Twitter. But <laughs> we actually expected the mobile browser to be higher yeah. in, in the sample. Which brings us to actual attacks with HTML5, right? Let's actually start using things. Now, there's tons of new features, right? Uh, I've already stated I think that the W3C is actually working with the RBN to uh, make it work better for attackers. Um, <laughs> if we're gonna, we gotta throw the buzzword out there, right? You know, HTML5 is apt, but um, oh. I had to say it, I had to say it. HTML5 is great. Yes. Now, one of the best features, forget geolocation, forget audio, forget all the cool stuff we're gonna talk about. For me, one of the best features is the fact that currently with HTML, different tags support different events. For example, your on load event works on an image tag but doesn't work on an HR tag, right? It's just not a supported attribute of the HR tag. Well, HTML5 has set the standard to say that all events are valid for all tags. Thanks. That awesome. means, yeah, winning, exactly. That means that your HR tag, you know, a little line going mm -hmm. across the screen, that has an on load event. When does it fire? At page load in most browsers that support it, right? Which is kind of nice. What makes that even better is the filtering that people are doing, right? I'll accept HTML input, but I won't let you put an on load event on an image, because that's evil, Tom showed me that, right? So we'll block that. But the way the filter was written doesn't take into account this brand new expanse of events opening up on tags. So your filter is going to let that through. So when I'm attacking your app, because, well, that's what I do, uh, I can now use that to bypass your web app firewalls, your filtering built into it, ESAPI, whatever you're using, right, built into it. Now, of course, there's also the, the information gathering attacks, right? I can start grabbing information about the browser, turn on the webcam, turn on the mic, whatever. I can also start changing the way your browser behaves, right? And that's where we get to start playing around. Now... <laughs> You're shooting yourself. <laughs> yeah, just by running it. Um, we say this is advanced attacks, but I want to be very blunt here. This isn't advanced. This is simple shit. The problem is nobody's doing it, right? So advanced, right? It's the way it works. So we're going to start playing around with these. We're going to start with homing beef, which is something we talked about before. We just want to throw it out there because it's really cool with HTML5. We're going to talk about audio attacks. Uh, it's not up on this slide because we added that 10 minutes ago. And, um, the, and we're going to talk about application cache and data URIs. Now, data URIs is not HTML5. Data URIs have been around for a while, but when I start dealing with H, uh, HTML5 attacks, injections and stuff like that, I find that data URIs allow me to better slide things in through the filtering. Yeah, and that it actually was pretty amazing when Kevin first brought that up to me. I was like, wow, I never even thought about using data URIs for pen testing. And um, you'll find that really interesting too when we get to that part. And I'd like to take credit for coming up with it, but it came out of the amazing book, Web Application Obfuscation. Um, mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, I'm blanking on the guy's name, Mario whatever, the, the author yeah. of the book, excellent book. It's one of the few Singress books I would actually recommend. <laughs> uh, oh, did I say that out loud? Damn, inner monologue's broken again. 
So homing beef is something that uh, Kevin and I released uh, was it last year yeah. Uh, yeah. for uh, OAuth AppSec DC, part of one of the Social Zombies talks. But um, this basically allows, if you use beef, um, it'll allow you to plot the location of your your zombie, which is your victim, um, all through a beef hook. You can actually see where they are right now or turn it on in tracking mode and follow them if you've hooked like a mobile device or a laptop that they're moving around. You can actually see them moving using JavaScript. Isn't that what you want JavaScript to do? Of course. So instead of just you know uh, stalking somebody, which is this is really fun for, um, the other thing to do is um, obviously for uh, pen test scoping. So if you're scoping an executive and you want to make sure that he's actually in a building for whatever reason, um, this is something that you could do, use this for. He's not sitting at the Taco Bell or the Wendy's, right? right using their wireless. Talk about the caveats. Yeah. So uh, the, one of the problems as a pen tester, right, uh, is most of the browsers nowadays have a notification icon. One, they'll they'll say, "Hey, is it okay for this web page to know where the hell you are?" Users yes. usually click it anyway. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah, it's fine, no problem. Um, or they ha they get the little icon, you know, the the circle with the like the targeting device or whatever to say, "Hey, this is tracking you right now." The other problem we're having is is that geolocation is very problematic. Uh, browser support for it is widespread, but a lot of times it will only fire the very first time you load the page, go back and I don't get it again, uh, or it'll fire once, not fire the first time, or it won't fire the first time, fire the second time. It's, it's really problematic. So when you're dealing with geolocation, the answer is fire it a lot. If this is one of the few times where that, the, the definition of insanity is false. You're all about firing a lot and early, I heard. But oh, oh, oh. <laughs> so, so you got to be careful with that, right? Wait, that wasn't timed right. <laughs> we all, oh, nice. man. Now, HTML5 also has this great audio feature set, right? We can have input and output controlled by HTML5 and JavaScript because that's what we want. We want our web pages um, talking to us, listening to us. Who's seen the mic icon on Google search? Right? It's HTML5. Isn't that beautiful? You go there, you click it, you yell at your computer, it does something. So, <laughs> you guys yell at your computers, right? So, let's move to the next one. Um, Output. So one of the things that you can do with HTML5, they created the, you know, the native audio support. Let's have an audio tag because that's what I want is more of those damn banner ads yelling at me. <laughs> um, hell, let's make our XSS tags. You idiot, you click the link. Do you think that would work for user awareness training, right? Forget the I click next. No, the damn computer's calling you stupid. It's as, almost as good as hitting them in the back of the head. Should say agent deployed. <laughs> agent. <laughs> Asian deployed? Agent. Agent. Oh. So, oh, you're not familiar with that, are you? Know, you? However you want to do it. I, I don't know. I, <laughs> this talk just took a weird turn. So <laughs> output, right, is always great. But this is kind of fun. I like input better. Our browsers now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You have heard that, right? Yeah, it's because I told you. But input is where our browser can actually turn on our mic and start listening in. That shouldn't scare anybody, right? It's okay. We're here from the government. We're here to help. Um, you get a little mic icon. And the idea behind it, Google Chrome supports this, by the way. Thank you, Google Chrome. Um, the idea here is, is that you can click it, turn on your mic, it'll send the stream out for maybe voice recognition, bring that back and actually enter that into the form for you, right? Uh, I personally like going to Google when I'm bored, turning on my mic, yelling stuff at it and seeing how messed up it is, right? <laughs> wow, that's what I said? Um, my daughters come in, yell stuff at me, my computer searches for it. Um, we have a couple options here. One, we could ask the user to click it. And they'll click it usually. Yeah, yeah most of them will. Um, or why don't we jump back to that attack from what, two years ago, the like jacking, where we can float a div over the mic, give them a game or something to play. When they click it, they're actually clicking to turn on the mic. Now, one of the ideas I have with if combining these two features have you ever thought about injecting code into an XSS flaw that plays sounds that your mic then picks up 
and the sounds are commands to the browser to click things. It would be an audible CSRF mm -hmm. attack, right? Whoa, Wouldn't that be deep. fun? Woo. Now, uh, a good friend of mine uh, actually works at Secure Ideas, Chris Cuevas. He's an audio nut. And he actually believes, we've not been able to prove this out yet because of timing, but he actually believes that he could play the sound above or below the register that the human ear can hear and still have the mic pick it up in certain machines, maybe high-end computers, Macs. Um, and so we could actually play it above what you can hear or below what you can hear, so it would be an inaudible, audible cross-site request forgery attack, right? Kind of fun. You know, not amazingly useful. We wouldn't do it during an attack. What I would do is just turn on the mic, listen in, pull that file across, and know what you're talking about. Because um, you never talk about anything important in your cubicle, right? Because work doesn't happen there. <laughs> yes, I don't even want to know. Well, actually, I do. No, 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 wait. The next feature we want to talk about is web workers. This is the idea of how many people have seen this pop up? Right, you go to a web page, you sit waiting, 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 waiting for your porn. And, um, excuse me? Your iPhone's really good at this one. Right, the script is busy or unresponsive. How do you know which one it is? Well, it's JavaScript. It's probably just busy. Um, <laughs> right? This is a problem, especially when we're talking about like beef hooks, where we want to shove attacks down into the browser and the user doesn't click this, uh, link, this OK button fast enough. So we're stuck on one attack. So one of the ideas we have is what about taking these web workers, which is the ability to tell JavaScript to execute multiple things at once, right? So you have data intensive things like uh, uh, processing audio or video files or maybe spell checking or, or prefetching data. Well, let's tell it to do multiple attacks. So port scan the network, browse the history, figure out what web pages this user has been at, and start sending other attacks up to the servers. And the key to, for this is because, you know, the, the one caveat to beef right now, I, which I know is being worked on, I know Wade and, and the other guys in beef are working on more of a persistent beef, um, and we got some ideas around that too as well, um, but if the user closes the browser, it's done. Um, so the more quickly that you can do attacks on the clients yep. uh, and doing multiple things at the same time, that's where web workers really come in handy. I like to call it efficiency, but let's be honest, I'm lazy. Um, so I want the browser to do much as, as much as possible. So the idea is we can start pushing this in. Now the problem with web workers is there are certain limits. We want to be very clear here. These limits are not security limits. This is not where the W3C got a clue and said we can't implement this, it would be bad. These are architecture or design problems, right? Like access to the DOM. Well, the problem is the DOM's not thread safe. If something updates what you just read while you read, right, it's just all messed up. So they just block access to it. They block access to the window, the parent, the document as a whole. Um, Google Chrome also al won't allow web workers to be loaded from a file that you just opened. So if you double click on a file on your desktop, it can't use web workers. Again, not a security feature. They don't allow local files to open up, uh, it, local HTML files to open up file handles and web workers is treated as a file handle, right? And so it's blocked. I expect that limitation to go away very soon with Google Chrome because web workers, one of the great things with the design of it is that web workers will be for when you have a desktop application that has to do a whole bunch of stuff, so that, that limitation blocks that purpose of web workers, right? Now currently, the, uh, oh wait, flip back one. Uh, currently with web workers, our code doesn't work exactly right. Um, we're hoping to get that done pretty soon. As we'll talk about later in the next couple weeks, we'll be releasing this code um, to do these kind of attacks. You? Start off. Data URIs. Data URIs are brilliant. Um, the idea here behind data URIs, these have been around for years. Uh, I, if I remember correctly, like 99 is when you started seeing support for data URIs. I'm probably wrong on that because I'm thinking it from memory. The idea here is, I want a self-contained HTML file, right? I don't want my HTML file to have to go out to the internet to pull down graphics. I don't have to give the user a whole bunch of graphics. Uh, Microsoft tried to do that with, what was it, CHM, the compiled uh, HTML files. 
data URIs give us this with a standard way to do it that is cross-platform, right? Um, most of the major, major browsers, modern browsers support this. Uh, it allows you to embed binary content. And because they're embedding binary content, they support base64 encoding that content, right? So that you basically have a text string that can be embedded in the web page. The browser will base64 decode it and then act upon the resulting string or binary file. So right. think about all the stuff that you could actually encode as a data URI. I mean, in this example here is a beef hook, but you could do cross a scripting as we'll you know, talk about in this next section. Um, <clears throat> you're basically evading all the filtering, all that filtering that's in place by whether it be a WAF or whether it be something else. Um, this is very, very hard to, uh, for uh, any kind of filter to detect. Yeah. And just to be very clear, what's happening here, see how you've got the data colon and the content type and then the base64, right? And a lot of people will look at that and say, well, that's okay, I'll just filter out semicolons and slashes and that'll break that. Uh, the content type is not required for most browsers. Uh, most browsers, if the content type is left off, will try to determine the content type. And since all we're sending down is plain text, right, JavaScript, they understand it, they act upon it, and deal with it. And so what you're dealing with is, do you allow colons and commas? And that's pretty much it. Because you're not going to start base64 decoding every arbitrary string that's pushed into your browser, into your application. And that's what you would have to do. You'd have to decode it and then act upon what happened there, right? So definitely as, as web pen testers, uh, you guys need to be taking advantage of this and start using it. I know I really didn't even think about data URIs until Kevin mentioned it to me. So just something, a uh, yeah, little tree trick there. I will tell you that my clients hate them. Uh, I'll <laughs> do my, a pen mine test. will too. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll do a pen test of their web app and they'll be all proud because they've got some filtering that their developers smoked some crack and built um, or download it off the internet because that's safe. And uh, you can't hack us. I always love when people say that to me, right? It's like a challenge. Can you do a pen test of me? Yeah, we don't expect you to find much. Oh, <laughs> okay. Um, I just got domain administrative rights through your web app. So uh, offline beef hooks, I kind of mentioned this earlier. You know, we love beef. Wade Alicorn is, is a god to us, you know, the, the guy that created the, the uh, beef project. You guys have all used beef, right? Please say use beef in your pen test. You have to. It's Even awesome. the vegetarians I know use yes. beef in pen tests. <laughs> Um, you know, beef was created, you know, to really demonstrate, you know, um, you know, the, the, the trade old, you know, pop-up window, you know, XSS, um, great, it's cross site scripting, who cares, what can you really do with it? Well, you know, beef actually takes that to the next level and actually integrates Metasploit and all kinds of very cool things into client-side attacks. Um, but the one problem with beef is that it's keeping that connection alive. So as soon as the user closes the browser, you lose your connection and you lose your shell. Or if they um, browse away right. from the page. Exactly. So um, there's some solution to this. You know, there's, there's I, an iframe within the site. There's pop-up under Windows, different techniques. Um, but of course, Kevin's going to talk about uh, the wonderful W3C has given us a great solution for this. The application cache. Yes. The application cache is this great idea. If we're going to start using HTML as an application language, well, how pissy would you be if you had to be connected to the internet at all times for your application to work? Uh, so let's give you the ability to take your entire Gmail mailbox and actually interact with it offline. Let's have it set up so that it doesn't matter how fast your internet connection is, things will work. The app cache does that. If you set an application as cacheable, the browser will retain it and act upon it even if you're not dealing directly with it or dealing with the, the connection. Right, and so we're able to play with this. Now there's a couple of things we need to make it work. Flip back real quick, um, it, sorry. We need the manifest file, and we need the resources that we want it to use. Um, now one thing to be very clear is that the manifest file has to have a specific content type. This is one of the things, and I will acknowledge the fact that we're talking about this now because I'm an idiot and had to fight with it for a while and then realize what I had done. The manifest content type is not a default content in most web servers, right? And so you have to go and add a new content type to the web server that is serving this MF file. Now, personally, I will admit that I like saying MF file, but uh, that's a totally different issue. Um, so you have to add that content type and then, you know, 
reload the config or restart that web server before this will work correctly. Uh, and it's a pain in the ass to troubleshoot it because you're getting the manifest file, the browser is just silently ignoring it as a manifest. Right? And so this is a manifest file. Now there's a couple interesting things here. Right? We'll start with, see the, the capitalized cache network and fallback? These are the three categories of things that you can have. Now the cache is the pieces that make up the offline application. Right? This is the stuff that the browser will support in offline mode. You also have your network category. These are items that if you go to access them, you have to be able to be on the internet. And so the browser will reconnect or something like that. Um, and you also have your fallback. If this is not available, access this instead. Or if we go to access this, access this instead uh, in offline mode. Right? So it allows us to build things. The other thing at the very top, see where it says 2011 to 27 version 42, the answer. Um, that is a, basically a serial number. If you want to update like the JavaScript files or things like that, that serial number has to change for the browser to reload the app. So this is actually the one hurdle I'm trying to overcome in Beef is to automatically, every time it tries to send a new command down, update that serial number so that the browser will reload the application cache. It flips. So um, by default, it doesn't work. Uh, we actually had uh, Tom dress up like young Indiana Jones and then dress in a cow suit for some reason for this picture. Um, <coughs> we have to be able to add information to the HTML tag. So with this, we're actually using the iframe and, and, uh, or the pop under window that we talked about earlier. We're still working on other ways to, to bypass those controls. But what's beautiful about this is, is that when we use the app cache with Beef, they don't have to be connected to the Beef controller. Our attacks, the things that we send down, the things, hey, port scan this network, do this, they run. The browser handles those, treats them in offline mode, and then the next time the user browses over to our beef hook or browses over to our beef controller, right, the beef controller can pick everything up from the other great HTML5 feature which we didn't talk about because we've talked about it before, web storage, right, long-term storage that's better than cookies in HTML5. We can just pick up the data and then issue new commands and the browser keeps going, right. Beef is now persistent across pages using this type of attack. So yeah, we're going to continue to do more testing and then we're going to be working with the beef project to integrate more of this in into the project. So hopefully we'll be having we'll be seeing persistent beef uh, coming out soon. Persistent, persistent beef. beef. That's right. Isn't that Viagra? Yes. So uh, preven <laughs> preventive measures for all of this. Well, of course, you know, don't use a web browser. Don't use JavaScript. Disable JavaScript. You don't need that for the internet. Um, and don't use your computer. Close your business. Fire your employees. Um, don't surf the tubes. Yeah. Yeah, th this is a hard one. I mean, because we're abusing the features that are in the browsers, um, from a protection standpoint, there's not a whole lot that you can, you can do. I mean, have you tried surfing the web without JavaScript? Or have you tried using NoScript? I mean, it's possible, but I can't give my mom, uh, you know, NoScript. I Don't mean, run it's just no not going to work, you know. Um, so, you know, the, f the features that we're, we're talking about, these are what the developers want. And, you know, like Kevin says, you know, developers are mostly on crack and they're just going to keep adding these features into the browsers. But um, developers really need to think before they code and then ensure that they're putting in the proper precautions. Um, you know, a great example is like the geolocation working group. Um, you know, their developers mailing list, um, they're actually talking about privacy, talking about how, co how can we protect the client in some way because they know that eventually this stuff is going to get abused. Right. Plus, from our browser perspective, why don't we give us the option to turn it off? Why can't I go into the preferences of Firefox or IE or Chrome and say, I don't want this, I don't want this, I don't want that. Right now, your browser supports HTML5 whether you want it to or not. If you've upgraded to a version that supports it, you support it. There is no ability for the user to make an informed decision. And in that case, I mean, heck, there's conversations on the Mozilla bug reports right now about disabling Java because of the beast option. Right? But we're not even worried about HTML5. Right? Again, I've got to ask, are we paying attention to the right 
security? Are we paying attention to the right things? And in, th in that case, now I'll tell you, I'm not picking on Firefox, I'm not picking on Mozilla. They're just more open than Google or IE are, so we can actually see where their thought process is going. We can see the idiocy they're ask being asked to do or recommending that they do, right? Um, we need to start providing feature sets back and control. Yes, I know that most users are gonna say, I need that, I need that, I need that, I need that, they're gonna turn it on. But for the subset that are intelligent, the subset that didn't check their brain at the door, let's give them the ability to turn it off. It'll be in Firefox 27, which will be out next week. <laughs> So uh, all the code that, that Kevin and I worked on and samples, um, we're going to be releasing that over the next couple weeks. Um, we're, we got a little bit more work to do for this, but um, it is going to be up there. We're going to put it on the secureideas.net site. You can also find it on the Secure State site when we get it up. And then, of course, follow us on Twitter. Uh, so I'll mention one more social network. <laughs> but uh, uh, we'll be posting links to everything on there. All right, guys. We'll, we'll be up here for questions, but uh, thanks for coming. I appreciate it. Thanks to DerbyCon. Everybody get home safe.